Welcome to the High Energy Density Science Center seminar series. I am pleased to have with us today, Dr. Yuan Shi, who is a Lawrence Postdoctoral Fellow in the Physics Division at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. His current research topics include laser plasma interactions, theoretical physics, and scientific computing. In a recent work, Dr. Shi and team demonstrated a first of the kind uh, of the kind example using actual com quantum computing hardware to solve a problem relevant for plasma physics. Prior to joining Livermore, Dr. Shi earned his master's and PhD in astrophysical sciences program in plasma physics from Princeton University, where he was a recipient of the Carl Oberman Fellowship. His PhD work was awarded the Marshall Rosenbluth Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Award by the American Physical Society for elegantly describing three-wave coupling in oblique magnetic fields and for adapting quantum field theory to describe plasma physics in strong field regimes. Yuan has a bachelor's in science from the University of Hong Kong, where he was a recipient of the Rosita King Ho Scholarship. Uh, so today's meeting is being recorded. So if you're uncomfortable with that, please log off. And also please be aware that this is an unclassified meeting uh, with people logged in from outside the lab and, and foreign nationals. So uh, please be aware of any export control issues. Otherwise, uh, please sit back and enjoy, and I hope you enjoy the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation to give a talk here. Uh, so then I'm going to talk about our work, uh, which is by a large group of people uh, listed on the title slides of using uh, quantum computers to simulate a toy problem of laser plasma interactions. Uh, so, so just to give some background about quantum computing, so compared to classical computing, quantum computing is really still at the baby stage where there are very limited things uh, you can do with the actual hardware. But at the same time, there is a great promise uh, that quantum computing is to, going to bring something uh, really big uh, for many applications. And there are essentially two reasons behind that kind of promise. And the first one is that the ideal quantum memory uh, can potentially hold uh, exponentially more information than a classical uh, computer. So classical computing, as you all know, uh, uses classical bits, which is basically zero and one. So you have like binary uh, number for each bit. Uh, so in this case, to specify state of n bits, I need exactly just n numbers. Like uh, for example, if you have three bits, you need three numbers like 101 to specify the uh, state of that uh, memory. But the difference with quantum computing is that it utilizes quantum mechanics. Uh, so what quantum mechanics does is that allows you to have superpositions of states. So if you see on the right, that's typically a, a block sphere showing you like all the superpositions that are allowed between the zero and one states. Uh, so in this case, although you just have two states, but you uh, the parameters that are required to specify the state uh, leaves on the sphere. So it's kind of a 2D uh, thing instead of just like uh, one or two numbers. Uh, and because of the quantum superposition, in order to specify the state of n qubit, you need two to the n numbers. Uh, for example, here I give an example of three qubits, and I listed the wave function and expanded in the basis uh, state. As you can see in this case, it requires eight uh, coefficients, uh, which is like eight numbers, uh, instead of just three numbers, as would be the case for classical bits. Uh, so therefore, if the quantum computer memory works in the ideal way, uh, with just a few qubits, you can hold a lot of information. So that's one of the advantage of quantum computing. And the second advantage of quantum computing is that there are known algorithms that can offer speed up compared to classical computing algorithms. And, and the reason for that is essentially it comes down to how the system works. So for what, uh, ideal quantum computer, what you do is unitary operations in the Hilbert space. Uh, compared to a classical computer, it uses like irreversible operations. Like when you sum two numbers, you get a third number, you kind of reduce two number to one number. So that's a kind of irreversible operations. So you kind of lose information as you go on a classical computer. But for ideal quantum computer, all those information are presumably somewhere in the Hilbert space, and you just need to have a smart algorithm to try to dig out the information you want. So there are a few notable quantum algorithms that offers exponential speed up. 
Uh, perhaps the most famous ones are the quantum Fourier transform and the Schultz algorithm for prime factorization. And those are big motivations for early development of quantum computing. And there are also other algorithms like the Grover search and quantum random walk and the quantum Hamiltonian simulations. And they all offer uh, different kinds of speed up compared to the best known classical algorithms. Uh, but there is a caveat here. So all these ideal quantum algorithms, they rely on basically ideal quantum computers. So what means on a hardware level is that you need error corrections, at least uh, for them to work out. So if you don't have error corrections, none of these algorithms can give you the results you want. And the reality is at this stage of the development of quantum computing, the, the error corrections are not uh, widely available yet. So basically you're living with the situation where you kind of have quantum computers. They have a, a promise in the far future, but in the near future, uh, none of these promising algorithms can potentially work out. Okay, so what do we do? Can we still do something useful? Uh, so there are a number of people thinking about uh, actually using quantum computers to simulate physical systems. And that may be helpful because you essentially have a kind of analog uh, computer. You have one physical system that kind of emulate the behavior of another physical system. And even if you have noise and so on, but your real physical system may also have noise. So sometimes people believe that you can still have some quantum advantage when you simulate a, a physical system. And that's usually come down to uh, applications in condensed matter physics. And people usually believe uh, quantum computing can offer some kind of advantages for condensed matter problems via the quantum Hamiltonian simulation. And that's that's an kind of easy to understand rationale. So you have a quantum system you want to study. You have another quantum system that can be kind of programmed to emulate the system you want. So you kind of have a, a, a mapping between them. So that's kind of a natural thing to expect that quantum computers can be useful for quantum mechanics problems. Uh, but how about uh, plasma problems? Uh, so plasma problems, in most cases, they are classical problems. Uh, so they're not quantum mechanics, they are classical. And also many of the quantum uh, classical problems, they are nonlinear. And um, essentially because linear problems are just so simple, you just know the answer, you don't need to solve them on a computer. So the interesting problems are usually nonlinear problems uh, for plasma physics. Okay, but on the other hand, the quantum Hilbert space, it's a, a vector space. So it's, first of all, it's a, a, a usually a finite dimensional thing. And the second thing, it's a linear space. So there are a number of obstacles if you want to use uh, essentially a quantum system to kind of represent a classical system. So there are issues over there. But on a big picture, so there are a number of connections uh, between pl uh, plasma physics and condensed matter physics, which I kind of illustrate uh, using the diagrams on the right hand side. Uh, so if you're a plasma physicist, you probably are very familiar with kinetic models, the fluid models for plasmas. And essentially that's just a reduced uh, descriptions as you go to uh, from kinetics to fluid models. Uh, but however, probably uh, many people are not aware that the kinetic models are reduced models of QED plasma models. So essentially you start from uh, QED, which is believed to be the fundamental law uh, governing electromagnetic interactions with charged particles, and you do a geometric optics approximation, that's how you get a kinetics model uh, from QED models. So the kinetics model are kind of describing particle in the phase space. And that's kind of classical particles. And that's uh, the, and the reason why you have a classical uh, approximation is because you have a classical limit of the QED models. Uh, and, and at the same time, if you go down the model hierarchy uh, from the fluid models, you can have some uh, reduced models for uh, plasma physics. Uh, so for example, like the ray tracing models, uh, sometimes people use, they kind of trace array on the background of fluid uh, plasma, so the, the re reducing model itself is a reduced model. It's kind of further uh, geometric approximations of electromagnetic waves uh, in fluid uh, Maxwell plasma models. So that's the plasma side. You have this uh, model hierarchy all the way uh, from QED down to some reduced models for your specific applications. And on the right-hand side, I just uh, kind of compare with how the models for condensed matter physics works. And if you're a condensed matter physicist, you probably know the right-hand side very well. Uh, so usually people don't start with QED, they kind of start with uh, maybe the Schrodinger's equation or maybe the Dirac's equation, depending on uh, if you want 
to keep relativistic effect. But in the end, you want to solve a many body problem where you have many electrons, many ions, and they couple somehow. So there are the level of models for condensed matter physics that directly solves uh, different versions of the many body problems. Uh, and sometimes that's more challenging. So people kind of, uh, in some sense, or in the language of plasma physics, integrate out the wave function part of the problem and just focus on density, electron density part. And that's kind of the density functional theory part. Uh, for condensed matter systems, and that's kind of uh, a reduced uh, complexity from the many body theory. And if you further reduce uh, from density functional theory to reduced models, for example, you can have phonons in your solids, and the, the, the very concept of phonons is kind of a reduced model uh, from a, a more complete model of uh, solids. And so therefore, uh, on both the plasma physics side and the condensed matter physics side, you have a model hierarchy all the way from very details down to a very few things that you keep track of on the level of reduced models. Uh, so, so th this is a, so there is a direct connection uh, between plasma physics and condensed matter physics on the level of QED and on the level of reduced models. But in the inter intermediate uh, hierarchies, maybe that's more uh, difficult to try to make a connection between the two sides. And and also uh, I should mention that. Even for condensed matter physics problems, it's not usually straightforward. How do you use a quantum computer to solve that? You know, so sometimes people think if you can map a problem to a quantum quantum problem, then you can solve it on quantum computer. But I would say that's just half the way. Because once you have a quantum problem, you still need to figure out how exactly quantum computer is going to be able to solve your problem. So, but at least there is a connection uh, between uh, the plasma side and the quantum side in some level. So in the following of the talk, I will probably focus. I, I would just focus on the level of reduced models, uh, where there is a direct connection uh, between the two, uh, between the classical and the quantum world. Uh, so the example I think uh, is probably familiar to uh, many of you if you study laser plasma interactions. So this is the three-wave uh, interaction problem. So this is a, a classical problem if you want to look at it classically, but at the same time, it's also a quantum problem uh, if you look at it quantum mechanically. Uh, so three-wave interaction is probably the simplest uh, nonlinear problem uh, you can think of, because if you just think of uh, the other, the nonlinear uh, term in the Hamiltonian, the cubic term will give you a nonlinear uh, kind of uh, uh, e equation on the level of the wave functions. So this is probably the simplest case of nonlinear problems, and this is the lowest order nonlinear coupling, which is very common in plasmas as well as in quantum uh, systems. Uh, so I just mentioned that a laser plasma interaction is an example in, for plasma physics. Uh, so in that case, on the Feynman diagrams on the right, maybe you have Raman scattering where you have two lasers coming in and interact with the third uh, plasma wave. So that's for plasma physics. At the same time, this kind of interaction is relevant for turbulence cascades. So in that case, the weakly lines on the right are probably your eddies in your turbulent fluid, and they interact and further cascade uh, in, in the turbulent fluid. And also, this is the same type of interaction in nonlinear optics, uh, where the interaction is actually quantum. So for that case, you may have uh, three photons uh, interact in a piece of crystals. And that gave rise to some non-trivial quantum effect, uh, but that's the same thing. That's cubic interaction, and also this very Feynman diagram is actually uh, from a quantum electrodynamics, uh, we, where you have electrons interact with photons, and they couple via this kind of cubic vertices. So I would argue that this cubic uh, vertice is essential for many of the physics problems, and for for the plasma part, now yeah, usually that problem can be uh, described uh, using the three-wave envelope equations, or sometimes you'll call that the coupled mode equations. So for plasma physics, A1, A2, and 3, the capital A's, they are some uh, function of space-time, and they satisfy this uh, envelope uh, equation, which is kind of the uh, an approximation of the more exact problem. So that's why this is kind of a reduced model. In a sense, they just extract the part uh, of the plasma model that you're interested in. Uh, but the same problem is actually a quantum problem uh, if you quantize these operators. So now instead of being functions A, A1, A2, and 3, they can be regarded as bosonic uh, operators. So in that case, 
uh, you have an interaction Hamiltonian which has cubic terms in it. And if you're familiar with quantum mechanics, if you look at this Hamiltonian, if you write down the Heisenberg uh, equation for the operators, they are exactly the same equations as the classical three-wave equations. Uh, so the quantum version is uh, is the version that governs the interaction in nonlinear uh, quantum optics. So it's, it's exactly governed by this type of cubic Hamiltonian. And just uh, 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 superficially, the equation, the quantum equation and the classical equation, they are identical uh, in this particular case, uh, except that the classical case, the, the A's are functions, but in the quantum case, uh, they are operators. Uh, but in any case, the problem that we're looking at here is this particular cubic uh, interaction problem, which is relevant, as I said, to many uh, other problems. Uh, so there is a, a challenge trying to map this problem to quantum computers. And that's usually because a quantum hardware uh, is not usually built uh, to have this Hamiltonian natively. Uh, so by natively, I mean the quantum hardware, it's a piece of quantum system. So that system is governed by some uh, Hamiltonian. So, so this particular HI is usually not a term uh, in the native Hamiltonian of the quantum hardware. Uh, so there is a question of can we actually program a general purpose quantum computer that doesn't have this type of interaction to simulate uh, the cubic interaction we want. And if you uh, are familiar with classical computing, you should say you should be able to do this. Otherwise, you don't have a general purpose computer. Right? Uh, so that's true, and the question is exactly how you do it uh, on a quantum computer. Uh, maybe to illustrate more of this point, I just want to uh, emphasize that simulating non-native interaction is challenging on quantum hardware, uh, regardless of whether that, that interaction is intended to be a classical one or a quantum one. So as long as it is non-native, it's a challenging thing to do. And the reason of that is usually uh, you need to understand the context of how people usually do uh, quantum Hamiltonian simulation. So usually you have a hardware, uh, which is some pieces of materials, uh, which is described by some Hamiltonian, which I call H naught here. So that Hamiltonian uh, usually contain a number of terms in it. So I will call each term just HK. So at the same time, you want to use that quantum hardware to simulate a different physical system. So the physical system you're interested in uh, is probably described by a different Hamiltonian, which I just called A. In the simplest situations, the terms contained by H is a subset of the terms contained in H naught. So in that particular case, quantum Hamiltonian simulation uh, will easily give you a quantum advantage uh, compared to classical computers. And the way it works is using the Lee uh, Potter Suzuki approximation. Uh, so, it, so for quantum system, what you want is kind of time evolution under the uh, Hamiltonian H. And if you want to expand that exponential, uh, because these operators, they usually don't commute, uh, you, it, it's, it's uh, it only equals Okay, so usually for a classical number, exponential of sum equal to the product of exponentials. But if they're operators, they're no longer satisfied. Uh, but that relation is approximately correct if you chop things up uh, sufficiently fine. Uh, so here, n is the number of how, how, how many times you chop the time uh, you're simulating. If you chop it very fine, then this expression becomes more, more and more uh, correct. And this is exactly how people do uh, usually do quantum Hamiltonian simulations. So, uh, basically, they chop the exact unitary evolution into pieces, which they can do uh, natively on the hardware. So on the hardware, it looks like something in the diagram uh, that I show below. So uh, if you're an experimentalist, you would just try to turn your knobs so that different terms in Hamiltonian are turned on or off for different durations of time. And by doing that properly, you can emulate the Hamiltonian that you want. But this only works uh, if H contain terms that are natively available in H naught. If you don't have that, then you need to somehow figure out how to do the unitary. And to do a general unitary, uh, it is known that it is an ex gen in general an exponentially expensive task to do. Uh, okay, so if you recall that some quantum algorithms give you speed up, but if you have an exponential cost in implementing that, then it kind of wash out your speed up. In the end, you don't have the quantum advantage anymore. So as soon as you have a non-native unitary you need to implement, it becomes a very challenging task on quantum hardware. Uh, 
Okay, so it's a difficult thing to do. Okay, so let's say somehow we can do it. Does it help us uh, with anything? Uh, so I would say, depending on applications, it may help you uh, with certain aspects. So again, I will take the example of laser plasma interactions, uh, so which is kind of shown on the right-hand side schematically uh, by these two diagrams. So you have two parts of the problem. So on one part, the lasers, they affect the evolution of plasma. For example, they change the plasma density as the laser propagates through the plasma. So the other side of the problem is how plasma affect laser. Uh, so once you have a plasma density, your lasers can refract and they can scatter and they can uh, behave differently depending on the plasma conditions. So you have a couple of systems of plasmas and lasers. And if you want to simulate a real-time dynamics, uh, that can be an expensive thing to do depending on how large uh, is your system. Uh, for example, in the ICF context, usually you do some hydrodynamic simulations uh, to find out how plasmas evolve under the drive lasers. And sometimes you need to run a post-processing of plasma conditions to see whether you have a self-consistent uh, laser uh, propagation or uh, scattering. And if that's not the case, sometimes you need to have an inline uh, LPI model turned on. But if you want to track every details like the cross-beam energy transfer, that simulation can quickly get very expensive. Uh, so, but schematically, that simulation is a two-part process. So, the fir for the first part, you evolve the plasma state uh, due to some laser state. So, schematically, I just write G, uh, G the G uh, bracket as some kind of plasma state uh, vector. So, that plasma state is evolved uh, under the action of lasers. So, the laser operator, I'll just call it A, uh, capital AAT. So, schematically, you want to advance your plasma state under the uh, action of laser, uh, let's say laser heating. So at the same time, you want to uh, self-consistently evolve the laser state. So what that looks like is, let's say I use a small a to represent the state of the lasers and capital G represent how plasma affect the laser. So schematically you have the laser state change uh, because of you have a plasma somewhere around. So schematically, if you want to do a real-time dynamics, you can do some kind of a splitting algorithm or something like that just to advance the plasma state and the laser state uh, self-consistently. Uh, and as, as I mentioned, that's can, that can be an expensive thing to do uh, on a classical computer. And uh, it, so, so this is where, where quantum computing might uh, be able to have help. Uh, so because, as I mentioned, the quantum computers, they're very primitive nowadays. They have very limited qubits, so we cannot solve the full problem. So what we do is we focus on the second part of the problem. So namely, how does the laser state evolve uh, for a given plasma condition? Uh, for this sub-problems, so usually if you want to track N uh, photon levels, or maybe in the ICF context, you want to track, uh, let's say, D, different uh, laser beams. Uh, so usually classically on a classical computer, it looks like a matrix uh, multiplication for each uh, time step. Uh, so, so schematically, if you represent your laser state by some vectors at each time step, you need to multiply, uh, you need to multiply that vector by a matrix. Uh, so let's say your vector is a D dimensional vector, then that matrix multiplication is something like D squared uh, operations on a classical computer. Uh, but quantum mechanically, uh, so if you take the uh, the thing in the red box, uh, literally, if you just take G to be some quantum gate uh, that act on the laser state, then if you have the gate available already, then each time step is just applying that one gate. Uh, and because of quantum uh, superposition, that one gate just act on the, all the laser states and evolve that. So, so kind of naively, you would expect there is a, a quantum advantage if you just have the gate available already. Okay, so, uh, so, but then the problem is how do you get a gate? Uh, so for the problem of laser plasma interactions, you need probably many gates that depend on the plasma conditions. For example, if you just care about the plasma density, then you at least need a one parameter family of the gate uh, that does the laser state evolution for you. Okay, so that's kind of a tricky thing to do. But once you have that, it becomes a simple problem because your initial state uh, is usually simple. So let's say some usually laser state, which quantum mechanically is some coherent photon state. So that's a very simple state uh, to start with. And also at the, in the very end, the readout uh, could be simple as well because the question you'd be asking might be like, 
how much laser uh, energy get deposited into the ca capsule. So that final thing is, uh, it's a final number to read out uh, if you don't care about uh, plotting a 2D fancy map. So, so the initial state and final readout could be simple if you have the cubic gate available. So the problem now comes down to how do you get all those cubic gates? And to prepare these cubic gates, there are things you need to do at a compilation stage. And that has certain cost associated with it. And I would just say it has overhead. But once you prepare these cubic gates ready, then if you apply these operations uh, on a quantum computer, it's just one operation. So systematically, so there might be uh, some uh, speed up uh, if you use quantum computer as a special purpose hardware accelerator for your particular uh, matrix multiplication and multiplication problem. Uh, okay, so let's get, get more into details of how we make uh, these cubic gates uh, for quantum computers. Uh, so essentially, we need to find an algorithm uh, in some way. And, and just to remind you, so the problem we're trying to solve is this cubic uh, Hamiltonian problem so on the top right, uh, where you see uh, uh, H1, uh, H equals to some uh, cubic terms of uh, A1, A2, and A3. So that's the particular Hamiltonian we want to be able to simulate. Uh, so naively, you may want to simulate this problem using your quantum hardware in, a, uh, in the way that the energy levels of your quantum computers somehow represent the energy levels of A1, A2, and A3. And, and usually because you need to satisfy some resonance conditions, you want to, let's say, omega 1 equals to omega three, 2 plus omega 3. So you may want to pick some energy levels in your quantum computers to somehow represent that. Uh, but if you uh, think about more deeply, you'll find this is probably not uh, a good approach uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, your quantum hardware, once it's built, it has specific energy levels. You don't want to just, you, you won't be able to change it just as you, uh, you like. It's something that's fixed. So you cannot have a general purpose computer that does this tuning for you. Okay, so this is the one problem. And the other problem is that usually if you build a quantum hardware, it has many terms uh, in its native Hamiltonian. And, and, and even if you can build a Hamid, uh, system that does have these cubic terms in its native Hamiltonian, there is a question of how exactly you turn off all the other terms you don't want. So there is a problem of how you do that on hardware as well. And the other problem is that this kind of mapping, I'll call the energy space mapping, is inefficient uh, because for a qubit, it's only either zero or one or superpositions. But for a laser, uh, there are like a billions of photons in it. So if you want to represent that, uh, each photon by one energy levels this way, it's a very expensive representation to do. So it's not efficient as well. Uh, so therefore, we come up uh, with a probably more versatile uh, algorithm, I'll call it, in the action space. So the action operators in this particular case, they're just combinations of number operators for the photons in the three modes. And the nice thing about these operators, action operators, is that they commute uh, with the Hamiltonian of your interest. And for quantum mechanics, uh, if you're uh, familiar with quantum mechanics, so whenever you have uh, some operator that commute uh, with your Hamiltonian, it's usually a good idea to find a simultaneous eigenstates of all these operators. And here they are in the bottom of the page. I kind of expand the wave function by eigenstates uh, of S2 and S3. So there is a particular basis we choose that's going to be convenient. And, and the advantage of choosing this particular representation uh, on quantum hardware is that it's much more efficient. Uh, for in, in this case, if you see the summation, it runs over J to zero, uh, all the way up to the minimum of S2 and S, S3. So S2 and S3, there are some kind of combination of the number of photons. So they're basically proportional to the number of photons. And the minimum number of that is what it takes uh, to have a Hilbert space representation. But at the same time, the number of photons you can keep track of is the maximum uh, of these two numbers. So let's say you have S2 equals to 10, but S3 equals to a billion. Then you only need a Hilbert space of 10 dimension to represent the interaction of a billion photons. So, uh, so therefore, in some regimes, this representation could be uh, very efficient. Uh, okay, so this is the representation. But once you have this representation, what's the dynamics uh, under the representation? So, uh, so in the particular case uh, of the, te uh, the, the temporal problem, uh, namely the uh, your operators only have 
time dependencies and they don't have spatial dependencies. In this case, the temporal three-way problem is exactly uh, the Hamiltonian time evolution problem. Uh, so, so you can look at this from two perspectives, uh, namely the Schrodinger's perspective and the Heisenberg uh, perspective. So on the left-hand side, uh, I write down the equations satisfied by the expansion coefficient. So C's, uh, they are the expansion coefficients. Uh, so you have eigenstates, you have expansion coefficients that gives you uh, your wave function. So these coefficients satisfy a Schrodinger equation and the Hamiltonian matrix uh, for that equation is the tridiagonal uh, matrix and it's a finite dimensional tridiagonal matrix. So therefore it's kind of a nice thing to have to have a finite dimensional Hilbert space because that can directly map uh, to a quantum memory without the need of any truncations and things like that. So if you solve the problem in the Schrodinger picture, you will get uh, these occupation numbers. And once you have these occupation numbers, you can compute different expectation values of your interest. For example, if you want to ask the question of how many laser photons are there at the end of the interaction, you can just compute uh, this expectation value during post-processing and you will find the answer you want. So this is the perspective from Schrodinger equations of what happens once you uh, represent your wave function in this particular basis. At the same time, uh, in a basis independent way, you can also look at what happens to the Heisenberg operators. So now on the top uh, right is N1, N2, and N3, and they are quantum number operators. So if you look at what uh, equations do they satisfy under the action of the cubic Hamiltonian, you'll find these particular equations. And now if you want to see what their expectation values satisfy, they satisfy a very similar equation except for two terms. Uh, so one term is this one, uh, which I uh, underline here. So this term is present in the quantum equation, but is absent uh, from the classical equations. If you trace back to what's the cause of that term, it's due to a spontaneous emission of a quantum system. So as you probably know, for a quantum system, there is a spontaneous emission, but in a classical system, there, there isn't uh, such phenomena. So therefore, there is an extra term in a quantum problem that is due to that. And the second difference is that in the quantum equation, you have n1 squared, uh, but in the classical equation, you have the expectation value squared. Uh, so they are, in general, different, except for state with Poisson statistics. Uh, uh, but, but that also uh, tells you what, uh, under what conditions does the quantum system behave like a classical system. And usually, a quantum system behaves like a classical one uh, when the wave packet is somehow localized, uh, so your quantum states are satisfied for some distribution, and also when the spontaneous emission is subdominant. So when you satisfy these two conditions, the quantum system and classical system, they essentially behave in very similar ways. Okay, so now we understand the kind of dynamics, uh, both quantum, for quantum problem and the classical problem. Let's see how do we uh, solve uh, an example of the quantum problem. Uh, so the simplest case uh, requires uh, three three levels, and it's essentially one plus half cubics, and that's easy to understand because you're simulating three wave interactions. If you're, uh, you probably an, at least need uh, three levels for a non-trivial problem. In this particular case, the Hamiltonian, uh, once you normalize it, it takes this particular form. A and the nice thing about this. Uh, the problem is that you can exponentiate uh, the Hamiltonian analytically uh, to find the unitary dynamics due to the uh, Hamiltonian. And this unitary operator uh, is what I would call the cubic gate. And namely, it's a unitary operator that enact uh, the three with uh, the cubic Hamiltonian. So that's why I call it a cubic gate. So U here is a cubic gate. So now we have an expression for the unitary gate on paper. And the problem is how do we implement it on actual hardware? And to talk about a hardware implementation, maybe let me step back a little bit and say what a kind of hardware are out there for us to use. Uh, so uh, as you probably know, quantum computing is still at a very early stage. And there are many architectures that are under development and they have different advantages and disadvantages. So there hasn't been uh, like a unique uh, winner uh, out of all these uh, developments. Uh, so I'll probably just mention four uh, architecture that are probably uh, very commonly used. And the first one is uh, superconducting qubits. And the picture of that is on the right-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it's a photo of the superconducting qubit at Livermore. Uh, so what superconducting qubits are, so they're basically some materials that 
behave nonlinearly. Uh, so there are some nonlinear oscillators, if you like. So these nonlinear oscillators, they're quantum oscillators, so they have different energy levels. And these energy levels, and they are being used as registers for quantum information. And to control these nonlinear oscillators, uh, usually people use uh, microwave pulses. And using slightly different pulses, you can also read out the quantum state uh, of your nonlinear oscillator. And one of the biggest advantage of superconducting qubits is that the fabrication techniques are already commonly used in the semiconductor industry. Uh, so therefore, it's usually uh, straightforward how you would make uh, your qubits uh, this way. And if you look at the quantum computing companies out there, like the IBM, the Google, um, many companies uh, utilizes this architecture. Uh, so that's superconducting qubits. And the second kind of architecture uh, that are uh, well developed is the trapped ion qubit. Uh, so in the bottom right, I've shown an image of what that looks like uh, for the Sandia ion trap. So what you see is essentially some electrodes and there are some ions uh, being trapped uh, by these electrodes. So in that case, the ions, uh, they are being used as quantum registers. And more precisely, it's the hyperfine levels of certain uh, ions that are being used. And those ions are usually controlled by these uh, electrodes or some lasers or even microwaves. And they are usually read out by shine uh, laser pulses and to see how the ions respond. Uh, so this uh, architecture, uh, in my perspective, has the uh, advantage of uh, potentially versatile topology. So namely, you can physically bring two ions together or separate them out physically in space. And that's because you can move your ions around in the trap relatively easily. Versus in your superconducting qubit case, once you build your chip, you can't really move your qubit anymore. So their interaction is kind of basically uh, frozen on the chip. You can only adjust that uh, electromagnetically. Uh, but for the ion case, uh, in, in, in principle, you can have more versatile uh, connection topology. So there are two other uh, architecture that are also uh, under development. One of them is the photonic qubit. Uh, so in that case, the photon states are being used as registers for the quantum information. And they, the photon states, they are manipulated by a network of uh, beam splitters and interferometers. Uh, so I didn't show an image here, but what that looks like is an optical table with all the mirrors in the interferometers and beam splitters. And usually uh, uh, on, on a scale of uh, how they're implemented right now, it's hard to do uh, uh, pro programming because the programming means you have to change your mirrors somehow. But potentially this architecture, uh, if you miniaturize them uh, with some special purpose uh, photonic uh, components, you can potentially make them miniaturizable and program programmable. And, and the advantage of that is that you can operate your quantum computer at room temperature uh, versus for ion traps and superconducting qubits, they are usually sitting inside uh, some dilution refrigerators, which is operating at very low temperature, close to zero uh, Kelvin. But for photonic cubic, they can potentially operate at room temperature, which is kind of advantage uh, in, in some cases. And also at room temperature, you can also use nuclear spins uh, as registers for quantum information. So in that case, you usually have a background magnetic field and the angular momentum states, they become degenerate and they can be utilized as registers. And for nuclear spins, uh, they're usually controlled uh, by some electromagnetic pulses, and these pulses can also be used for readout. So these are uh, basically for, uh, I would say, the leading architectures for quantum computers. But one thing they share in common is that they are in this so-called noisy intermediate scale quantum era. So namely, you can easily build many qubits, but it's really hard to get rid of the noise. And it's really hard, it's really non-trivial uh, to do error uh, correction. So, so basically you have many qubits, but they are uh, not fault tolerant. What that means is that if you want your quantum computer to do one thing, it may end up doing something slightly different. Uh, so that's the, the, the stage we're currently living in, is this NISC uh, era. Okay, so so we uh, we we basically try to uh, implement uh, the qubit gate uh, on hardware. So we have uh, two hardwares that we have access to and we utilize this. So one and the first one of them is a commercial uh, quantum computing company called the Rigetti. Uh, so they have a hardware uh, based on a superconducting architecture. So they have a chip, basically have uh, nonlinear oscillators on the chip, and they couple they can couple and control these uh, oscillators on, on the chip. Uh, so so in, in, in this particular case, we'll use this particular one chip, uh, but that probably is uh, a, a details that's for experts. 
Uh, okay, so but in this case, uh, we embed our three level problems into two qubits. Uh, essentially, we just use the 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0 state. Okay, so that's the quantum computers we have. And in terms of control, uh, so exactly how would you implement your unitary gate? So for Regatti's case, they offer a compiler that allows you to convert your unitary operators in terms of uh, standard uh, native gates. Uh, for Regatti, there are uh, uh, three uh, different native gates, the, the RZ gate, R, uh, RX gate, and the CZ gate in this case. And from their compilers, they can uh, decompose the unitary as the product of, in this particular case, 17 uh, native gates. Uh, so once you run uh, this 17 native gates, you propagate by one time step. Uh, for your three-wave interaction problem. And the data is shown on the right uh, if you allow the compiler to do uh, simplifications. So here on the right-hand side, the solid line is the exact answer if you have an ideal quantum computer. So P0, uh, in this case, you can imagine as your pump laser, and P1 is something like your scattered uh, laser. And P2 is something like your plasma wave. Uh, so this is the sim uh, this is simulating three wave interactions essentially in a pump depletion uh, regime. Uh, as as you can see, so uh, once the plasma waves and the scattered waves get uh, grows, the pump is deplete depleted. And for a purely temporal problem, and this process is periodic. So that's why you see these uh, periodic oscillations going on. Uh, but at the same time, this is a nonlinear process. So you can probably see, especially from P2, that this oscillation is not sinusoidal. It's, it has nonlinear uh, features to it. Uh, and th in this particular case, P3 is supposed to be zero uh, all the time. So it, and because it's not, it, it is a state that's not being utilized. Uh, so the level of P3 gives you a kind of a sense of the leakage. Uh, of your uh, quantum states out of your uh, ideal uh, Hubert space. So in this case, the hardware performance looks really great, uh, but with the caveat that we allowed for compiler level simplifications. So what that simplification does is essentially uh, multiply the unitary gates on a classical computer and only implement the final total unitary gate on the hardware. Uh, so, so, uh, so N here is essentially your time steps. Uh, so if you want a simulation run for 100 time steps, usually you would just do step one and do step two and so on. But the compiler simplification essentially does all that on a classical computer and only implement the final unitary. So that's why uh, perhaps the result looks so great. Uh, but, but at least it tells you that the hardware can do uh, 17 gates really well. Okay, so that's the situation we have uh, for the commercial hardware. And later on, I will show you if you turn off uh, the compiler simplification, the result will look uh, much more uh, terrible. Uh, so that so that kind of motivate us at Livermore to try a different approach. Uh, so at Livermore, as I showed you earlier, we have a, a 3D uh, transmon, uh, which is the uh, the box you see probably a few slides earlier. Uh, so that's our qubit. Uh, so uh, so, so that qubit is again controlled by microwaves. Uh, but in our even more approach, we instead of decomposing the unitary in terms of native gates, we uh, use an optimized control pulse just directly realize that particular unitary gate. Uh, so what does it look like is something uh, on the right. So on the very bottom of the page is a box in a box, and that's the qubit. So the qubit is some nonlinear oscillators that has different energy levels like zero, one, two, and three, and those are the uh, quantum registers for us. So what the a simulation looks like is that on a classical computer, we figure out a pulse and send the pulse through the system. And at the end of the pulse, uh, the quantum system will have evolved to a state that we demand. Uh, and we read it out uh, using uh, some readout procedures uh, on the right hand side. But in terms of the data, uh, data, what it looks like is that you place a pulse. So the big uh, plot on the left, the bottom left corner, is the microwave pulse you play uh, to the qubit. Uh, so it's a pulse. Once you play the pulse, the, the qu uh, quantum oscillator is going to evolve uh, under the action of that pulse. So the occupation probabilities are shown by the uh, central figure here. Uh, so C0 is uh, the occupation probability for the zero uh, ground state, and C1 is the uh, amplitude for the uh, first state. And at the end of the pulse, 
uh, the quantum system evolve uh, to the occupation probabilities you specify, which is the uh, colored arrows on the right hand side. So essentially, we specify what we want in the end and use a classical uh, optimizer to figure out what pulse will give us that uh, time evolution at the very end. So that's uh, the approach uh, we take a little more. And then, and I guess it's interesting to show a comparison uh, between these two approaches. Uh, so two slides earlier, I show how the Rigetti hardware perform if we allow the compiler to do the calculation on a classical computer. Once we turn that off, uh, the Rigetti data is shown by this cyan line. Uh, as you can see, you can initially track the exact dynamics, uh, which is the orange line. But once you go beyond 10 time steps in your simulation, it essentially becomes noise. And that's, uh, and that's uh, the, the reality of having noisy qubit uh, without error corrections. But if you count how many gates it takes to arrive at 10 time steps, uh, as I showed earlier, each time steps on Rigetti requires 17 gates. So if you want to evolve for 10 time steps, you, you have utilized something like 200 uh, quantum gates. Uh, okay, so for the Livermore one, uh, so we use a different approach. So instead of decomposing each step into many gates, uh, now each step is realized by a single gate. Uh, and that's why the performance on the Livermore uh, system is much better. So the blue dot here is the data on the Livermore hardware. As you can see, it can track the exact dynamics for much longer simulation time. But at the same time, uh, each simulation step is just realized by a single gate. And so in other words, by the 100 simulation steps, there has only been 100 gates applied for the Livermore hardware. So although the result uh, looks better, and that's essentially due to the fact of how the unitary is being realized. Uh, so the hardware performance uh, in terms of how noisy they are, they are uh, kind of comparable uh, for the two hardware, but the compilation here makes a big difference. So the hardware efficient compilation will allow us to do many more simulation steps uh, compared to the more standard approach uh, on a commercial hardware. And we can also look into uh, what causes the decay uh, from the ideal results. For the living more hardware, uh, we can exactly characterize uh, the features of hardware and we can send it into a master equation simulation and that gives the dashed line here. So the dashed line includes the fact of noise uh, on the hardware. As you can see, we can uh, probably attribute uh, most of the uh, decay to the noise in the system that we know of. Uh, so, uh, but, so that's for long time evolution. And for short time evolution dynamics, as we see, uh, both approaches can give uh, reasonably good results, uh, and the standard gate is okay for that purpose. And, and also, as I mentioned uh, uh, again, so this uh, two approach, they differ mostly by how you compile the quantum program. Uh, so, so because of the, uh, on a commercial program, each time step is re realized by 17 gates, that, that's wasteful of quantum resources. Uh, but, but in the end, both hardware can do something like 100 gates with reasonably high fidelity. Uh, so, so again, I want to emphasize the difference here is not so much about the hardware difference, but the difference mostly comes from how the compilers realize the quantum gate on the hardware. Uh, uh, and so the liberal approach requires an optimal optimization on a classical computer, and that can be an, an expensive operation to do. Uh, so if you want to do a simulation on quantum hardware, your compiler has to run on a classical computer. If that has to run for a long time, then the quantum advantage of doing that on a quantum system become uh, washed out by the time you wait, uh, you spend on a classical compiler. Uh, so therefore, we need to look for some other approach uh, to give us the control pulse. Uh, so one shortcut that works well for this particular case is that we can use interpolation uh, to find the control pulses. Uh, so, uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, so here the Hamiltonian is a one parameter family of Hamiltonians. So, so here S is essentially some parameter that um, <clears throat> here tells you how many photons are there in the system. So S is a, a three parameters. Uh, okay, so what we do is that we prepare the control pulse for S equals to two and S equals to a, a hundred or maybe infinity uh, using optimal control on a classical computer. So that's the expensive thing to do. But once we've done these two endpoints, we interpolate uh, what the control path should be uh, for intermediate S values. So in this particular case, we choose a particular interpolation scheme 
and that gives us very good fidelity as shown on the plot on the right. So one minus F is infidelity, it's on the level of 10 to the minus six, uh, which means it's F is very close to one, which means the interpolated control paths can give us pretty high uh, quality control compared to the expensive uh, numerically optimized pulses. So using this shortcut, we might be able to prepare control pulses uh, rather cheaply without relying on doing numerical optimizations all the time. Uh, okay, so, so, so as a summary, uh, so we try to work out the simplest toy problem uh, uh, for plasma physics, namely the cubic interaction uh, that's relevant for laser and plasma interactions. And in this case, we need to realize a cubic gate. And so this cubic gate, uh, we build it uh, entirely on the software level uh, without any hardware level modifications. So in a sense, we just demonstrated that non-native cubic gates can be programmed uh, and there's no need uh, for modify your hardware in a, for solving a different problem. So that's good. So that's a kind of a universal use of a hardware. That's kind of a step towards universal uh, quantum computing. And we do this uh, by having an action space algorithm that uh, efficiently represents uh, the nonlinear problem, uh, map that to a Hamiltonian simulation problem that is uh, a linear problem. Uh, so we, from this example, we demonstrated that quantum computers are useful for simulating nonlinear and non-native interactions. And uh, we demonstrate this algorithm on actual hardware, uh, one thing on Rigetti's hardware and on Livermore's hardware. In, in both cases, both hardware can do something like 100 to 200 gates. Uh, so therefore, it's very limited number of gates, so we have to utilize the gates efficiently. Uh, so the customized gates using optimal control or interpolation will enable us to utilize these gates more efficiently and then enable us to carry out more simulation steps uh, on the noisy hardwares. And for future directions, uh, we can kind of think of generalizing the cubic interaction to higher order nonlinear interactions that are in the fluid system, for example, the, the uh, quartic interac interactions. And also, of course, an obvious direction is trying to implement uh, this algorithm on hardwares that have more qubits and higher fidelity. So in our case, we utilize essentially two qubits because that's what's uh, uh, available given the K and D coherence uh, with even more qubit. But, but ideally, if you have a quantum hardware that have more high fidelity uh, cubic and high fidelity gates, we also try those problems. But in the end, uh, uh, if you remember, this cubic interaction problem is just a sub problem, for example, for the radiation hydrodynamic problem, it's a sub problem of that. So in, in the very end, we want to be able to uh, put every pieces together and utilize uh, these generalized N with gate as building blocks for more realistic uh, applications. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk. Um, so if you have any questions, you can either enter them in the chat field or, or let me know you have a question by raising your hand or making a marker, <laughs> speaking up if you like. Um, I guess I'll get things going. Um, so uh, of course, quantum computing is very much in its infancy. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, where where do you see the the, the field going for for plasma physics, like in the decades to come? Like, if you could have like your dream quantum computer, uh, what problems do you think it could really help us with? Uh, in particular, uh, one thing that's really important for plasmas is having uh, Coulomb inter interactions. Can quantum computers handle those? And um, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you do yeah, a mini body probably, plasma problem. Right. I'd probably start with Coulomb problem. So if you have Coulomb problem, you are more close to uh, the condensed matter uh, physics problems. Uh, because in condensed matter physics problems, usually the non trivial piece is the Coulomb uh, interaction piece. Uh, of course, if you have a quantum system, you also have exchange correlation piece and so on. But Coulomb piece is a central piece for condensed matter physics problems. And there has been uh, actually many research trying to solve the Coulomb problem on quantum uh, computers for solids. And you can imagine at some point you can generalize that maybe also for plasma physics, uh, because in plasmas you have uh, device shielding and other effects uh, that may be different uh, from what you have in you know, a piece of solid. Uh, but I would say to a large extent, the Coulomb problem is parallel uh, in the quantum uh, 
for quantum uh, condensed matter physics problems and for plasma physics problems. Uh, okay, and, and, and in addition to that, the Coulomb interaction, if you write down the Hamiltonians, it's usually like uh, A dagger, A dagger, an AA term. And those terms are something usually natively available on the hardware. Uh, so, so in some sense, in terms of implementation of hardware, the Coulomb problem may, may even be able to get implemented natively uh, using the native Hamiltonian of the system. Uh, so that's about the Coulomb problem. And for the plasma physics and quantum computing problem, so, so I guess the picture we have is that we need development on both uh, sides. For the quantum computing side, uh, apparently we need uh, better quantum computers. We need more qubits and need higher fidelity gates. Like in our case, we just utilize two qubits uh, qubit, and the result is already decaying uh, for, uh, let's say, 100 time steps. And if you want to do uh, more qubits, you certainly want to have higher uh, fidelity to be able to run your simulation for the time you want. So, so apparently on the hardware side, we need development of quantum hardwares. But at the same time, I think a little more, we're trying to do this uh, hardware software cool design. Uh, so namely, uh, so in this case, we figure out one particular problem that is amenable to the current hardware. And that's a, a good motivation for certain developments on the hardware side. Uh, so, so namely, if you can come up with problems that are relevant uh, for plasma physics, but also uh, instructive for how quantum computers should be designed or should be uh, uh, operated, so that's uh, help uh, as well. So, so in other words, if you have uh, development on a plasma physics side in terms of algorithms, in terms of how they be, might be uh, mapped to the hardware, so that development alone can kind of uh, synergistically uh, promote the development of quantum hardwares. And so there are many quantum computing uh, companies out there and they're developing hardware. And one of the things they lack are user cases. Namely, they need to find some examples where their hardware are useful for. Uh, for the ideal quantum computers, they are useful for many things, uh, but for the noisy hardware, uh, that's more limited. Uh, so therefore, if you can come up with user cases uh, that justifies uh, kind of the, the further development or investment in quantum computing, that would certainly be helpful. And that kind of user cases will come from uh, the plasma physics side. And that's kind of my view of how uh, the future of this field can develop uh, in this kind of uh, ecological system. Thank you. Are there any other questions? So how about um, ensemble systems? So like you know, in plasmas, we have thermal ensembles usually. Uh, could can you handle um, mixed states? Does that require like a, a parallel quantum computer sort of <laughs> to, to to do? Or uh, I think there are uh, many approaches to that. Uh, I guess maybe the simplest approach trying to do ensemble is to utilize the fact that quantum computers, they are quantum hardware and they are kind of in some thermal bath. So the quantum hardware itself it essentially is in some certain ensemble state. Uh, so there are efforts trying to engineer the noise environment of the quantum hardware to emulate a different kind of uh, ensembles you want to uh, simulate. So there are uh, developments in that direction. So that sort of bypasses or maybe trying to get around the noise problem. So, so, so one, the other approach is that you exactly implement what you want and do an ensemble for that. So that's something uh, you can also pursue, but because the quantum computers nowadays are too noisy, if you want them to do something exactly, they can't really give you that. So then the idea is that you might as well utilize the noise that are uh, you, that's hard to get rid of in the quantum system to to use that noise as a resources for your simulation, especially if you want to simulate a thermal uh, ensemble. So it's not a bug; it's a feature. Uh, yeah, use the bug as a feature. Yes, in some way. Yeah. Um, can I just add one comment? I mean, there there are if you have a you know perfect quantum computer that. Um, can control all of its errors. There are also other approaches, um, like you can embed the distribution in a larger Hilbert space, such that when you trace over, um, you know, part of the states, you end up with the thermal distribution you're after. Um, so I, I think there are tricks like that that you can play to actually get exact calculations. Um, 
of, of, of different types of ensembles. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker and I'll get yeah. a nice applause. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your time and attention.